Moving, moving into our second uh, plenary session, uh, we've got three amazing speakers. Um, and first up uh, is Susan Athey from Sanford, and she's going to be talking a little bit about Uber. So time, uh, I'll get time for you. Okay, perfect. Very good. So thank you so much for having me here. I love this conference. Um, I always learn so much, and this is such a great community. Um, so today I'm going to be talking about some empirical work I've been doing uh, using data from Uber. It's actually, the paper is a combination of uh, using um, observational techniques and experimental techniques. And really, the experiment is going to be a, a key part of the paper. But as you know, when working with tech companies, you can't always get what you want in terms of timing of presenting results. So unfortunately, today, I'm only going to be able to show you the observational parts of it. Um, the deadline of speaking at a conference about experimentation was not sufficient <laughs> to move bureaucracy as fast as I wanted. This is joint work with Camilo Castillo, who's an awesome PhD student from Stanford, and Dan Nuffel, who's a former PhD student from Stanford, who's now on the policy team at Uber. So the broad motivation is that you know, marketplaces for goods and services are increasingly prevalent. A key welfare benefit of the gig economy is flexible labor supply. And th that's uh, actually a bunch of papers are now coming out really documenting and measuring how important flexibility is in terms of the, the worker welfare. But that's, of course, in conflict with extensive training and certification. The popular concern is that somehow these marketplaces are reducing quality and safety. Um, but, of, but of course, those of us who are a little bit closer to the ground sort of question that conventional wisdom because we're seeing that actually like screening was never so hot to start with. There are lots of bad hotels and bad taxi drivers. But, and, and we have these really great technologies that allow us to have ex post monitoring, feedback, nudges, and ratings, which could actually lead to an increase in quality. Um, marketplaces also have another feature, which for me is just going to be a confounding thing that I can't separate out, which is that marketplaces tend to promote more personal interaction. You, you meet the guy from your Airbnb, you chat with your Uber driver, and that can also promote, promote quality. I'm not going to be able to separate that out today. So overall, the myth is that ride sharing provides flexibility, low prices, and convenience at the expense of experienced higher quality service providers. And I'm going to try to provide evidence today that that's not true, that in fact UberX is higher quality than taxis. And so this is something that um, in, you know, we'd like to show. It's a very interesting question. But you, you can wonder, well, how do I compare apples to apples? Like, How could I compare the quality of an Airbnb to a hotel? But the nice thing about the ride sharing setting and the reason I approached Uber for this is that you actually can have objective measures of quality because the phone captures telemetry. The phone actually tells exactly how the driver's driving, how fast, how slow, if they swerve, if they brake, if they accelerate, et cetera. And so you can, at scale, measure the quality. So it's a, Uber's a leading example of a service marketplace. Um, and it's one where a similar service is provided in parallel by an old and the new system, the taxis versus the Ubers. Now, when we think about safety and quality, there are many types of things you think about. In developing countries, you worry a lot about driver crime, like the driver's going to drive off somewhere and, and, and not threaten not to take you home unless you pay them. Um, but we're not going to focus on that here. It's not really an empirically big problem in the US. We're going to talk instead about driver safety and, dri in particular, driver responsiveness to user preferences. Now, it's awesome that you can measure things. But right away, you can sort of think that actually there's trade-offs, right? Because you might want your driver, you don't want your driver to drive perfectly safely. Um, you want them to get you to the airport on time. So that's going to complicate the analysis, but we will be able to, to make some progress on that. So we've got data from Chicago where there's a service called Uber Taxi, which is a dispatch system. And taxi drivers can turn on Uber Taxi. And just like you can switch between UberX and, and Uber Black, there you can also switch to Uber Taxi. And these systems are operating in parallel. Um, and so just to start with, I'll show like a kind of a motivating result that says there's something we should think about. So I've disguised, I haven't told you exactly what these metrics are because there's some sensitivity around, you know, like showing exactly what drivers are doing. But um, these two metrics are ordered, they're normalized to be normal zero one, and they are higher values of these two metrics correspond to safer driving. And so what, what this table is showing is the result of a couple of different empirical specifications comparing UberX to Uber Taxi. And the coefficient that's being reported is the coefficient on a dummy variable for a ride being an UberX. 
And so the, the kind of hypothetical experiment I'd like you to consider is that there's a, a person standing on a particular corner in Chicago, and they want to go somewhere, and I want to compare the safety of their ride but to, if they hopped into an Uber taxi or if they hopped into an UberX. That's what I'm going to be able to identify with this data. Now, you could argue that that's not the most interesting thing. Maybe I would want to look at all taxi rides or whatever else, but I'm sorry, I can't. Uh, I have to work with what I've got. So the, the way that I'm, I'm going to do this is we have many, many UberX rides, and we have a smaller number of Uber taxi rides um, because those generally originate from downtown and so on. And so what I do is I take all the Uber taxi rides, and then I find an UberX ride that starts in the same hour block of the week, so like Monday 8 to 9, and, and then goes from the same one geography to the other. So you're matched in terms of the origin, the destination, and the hour of the week. And so I've got 166,000 observations here. That's, I've got 80 odd thousand Uber taxis matched with an even number of Uber Xs. Now in principle, actually, I could get my standard errors down further if I matched with lots and lots of, of Uber X rides. I could, I could make this more precise, but because I've, I'm generally getting all the precision I need, I'm, I'm choosing to kind of minimize bias and just choose one match, the very best match. And then if I can't get a good enough match, I throw them out. So some, maybe some set fraction of them are thrown out. OK, so just a few questions. People, all, I'm going to run through these really fast. But taxis and Ubers basically have the same trade-off between time and mileage. It's just that taxis are about twice as expensive. Um, UberX is going to have lots of information for the drivers. They're gonna, you're going to see an average of your last 500 rides. That's your in-app rating. Um, there are incentives and warnings and so on based on those. And the experiment that I wanted to talk about today, and I will eventually include, is an experiment that they ran in terms of giving drivers nudges around safety. Um, generally, most people get high ratings. So this is a distribution of ratings. Most people get a five. Um, and if your ratings drop too low, you get warnings. So you get a warning at 4.6, a warning at 4.5, and you have to get down to 4.4 to be deactivated. Now, one thing that would make a, a um, paper really awesome on this, an economics paper, would be if I could say that everything is due to economics, and I can explain it all by economics. And in that case, it would be that, the, that Uber's incentive systems incentivize drive rider, drivers to drive more safely. But that's actually going to be very unlikely, because most people have high ratings, and it's actually really hard to get down to a 4.4. Um, you would have to, so I, I plotted here at the number of trips on the x-axis is how many trips you would have to have in a row to get a certain fraction of people at risk of being deactivated or getting a, a warning. And so even for the weakest warning, you would have to, for, for, for most, there, there would only be about 14% um, you know, of, of drivers who would be at risk of getting a warning after getting um, 20 trips in a row with a three-star rating, which is actually pretty hard to do. So the ratings are not really the most, the, the warnings and the explicit incentives are not really the most important thing, but they are getting feedback. OK, so now I talked about there being trade-offs and preferences. So what we do is we translate a suite of metrics that we observe about each ride from telemetry into uh, safety metrics, I mean, into star ratings. So basically what we do is we construct a variable, which is basically predicted star rating based on the safety metrics, and then we're going to use that as a dependent variable. And that we do use fit, trip fixed effects, so we're basically trying to say that like, within the same origin and destination, having better metrics gives you this much better star rating. And then I'll normalize everything that way. By the way, I should have said this in the beginning. Uh, uh, as I was talking about approval problems, um, please don't uh, circulate any of the numbers from this talk just because they're not final, and also we um, have not yet been approved to put the paper on the web. So we, we, this is a showing that there's nonlinearities. And I have one of my metrics is actually might, be, might possibly be something related to speed. And for that one, it turns out that higher is safer. That means slower is safer. But people actually generally don't like going slow. They want you to go fast. So people basically want you to go fast, but not drive really badly. Um, and, and so there's sort of nonlinear interactions with all of that. OK, so once we put everything in terms of these safety scores or, or these quality metrics, um, we can then look at the treatment effect of Uber on, um, on these scores. And so the scores, we're getting much lower coefficients. Um, the scores are, are, basically, we're getting the effects being roughly like one-tenth of a standard deviation. 
So roughly, being an UberX versus an Uber Taxi moves you a tenth of a standard deviation in the quality distribution. And we see kind of different effects for the score based on speed based in, or versus the score without speed. Um, then we try to take a look at responsiveness of the drivers to the passenger preferences. So we, I, after my very scientific survey of every Uber I rode in for several months, um, it's, they, they told me that the times they felt the most pressure to respond to passengers were airport trips, and also there was passenger heterogeneity in rush hours. And so what we find is that um, on the way to the airport, the Uber X and the Uber and taxis look more similar than the average trip. And so you can imagine that, that part of this is that they are um, you know, responding to the, the passenger preferences to have a, a slightly um, less safe ride. Um, we see actually a bigger gap between Uber and X and Uber Taxi in the morning rush hour. So maybe people are drinking their coffee and don't want it to be spilled. Um, one of the things that we still are working on, um, and this is one reason I don't want to push the specific numbers too hard, is that we, we are seeing in this some conflicting results between the speed metrics and the, the other metrics. And so the, in these kinds of trips, people seem to have conflicting preferences. And so we want to explore that functional form a little bit further. So um, then we try to look a little bit more at what are the other things that are leading drivers to change their behavior. So we look, want to we look, look at the effect of the rating. Of course, there's lots of endogeneity stuff about your past rating relating to your current rating. So what we do is we use an instrumental variable strategy where we look at the last trip that you did on the specific date and specific hour. And we look at the, the rating that other drivers got on that exact same trip in that same hour. And so the idea of it's raining or there's an accident or something else, that's going to make everybody get a bad rating. And we use that as an instrument for your rating on your last trip. And so then what we find is that if you got a bad last rating for reasons out of your control, you get a better rating on this trip. So drivers try to compensate for having had a bad performance last time by doing a better job this time. And that's actually, it's a, it's a pretty strong effect. We also find some effects on your safety, but the magnitudes are an order of magnitude lower. So they're just a tiny fraction of a standard deviation, and they're pretty precisely estimated. So we can basically rule out that there's a very large effect of, uh, of the app rating on the safety of your driving, which basically maybe you think that the, the drivers have other ways to make passengers happy, and they perceive safety as being a less important mechanism. We then take a look, and this is where I really wanted to show you experimental results, but um, we, we take a look to see how having received a warning about your rating affects your behavior. And there we see that if you've received a warning in the past, you are going to uh, get a better uh, rating today. You're also going to drive more safely today. But again, the, the, the co coefficients are small and they're precisely estimated to be small, which says that there's a, the effect is, is not is not um, overwhelming. So broadly, pulling this all together, um, the, the, the main results are that it appears that UberX is higher quality than taxi in terms of the safety metrics that we can compare between them. Although it would make a, an easier to exposit paper, the effect cannot be fully accounted for by direct incentives, just because most drivers are just not at risk of being deactivated. Um, but they do, the drivers do seem to be paying attention to their rating. Like what happened, what, what their app is showing, whether it's showing that you have a warning or whether it's showing that the last rider didn't like you, they're noticing it and they're responding to that. But, but safety is a smaller part of that story. And so where we want to then look at an experiment is an experiment that sends them specific warnings about safety and see if, if basically if the drivers sort of think that Uber is monitoring their safety, that may become more salient to them and they may respond to that more. And it may also be just the drivers, you know, the, the, the effects of, of safety on ratings are actually pretty weak. So the drivers may not be learning as fast about what the passengers want, where for like somebody just puked in my car or, you know, I don't have a power adapter or something like that, you know, you're getting much faster feedback on that and the drivers are learning more quickly. Um, and so basically in an ongoing work, we want to further tease out the sources of these differences and also further make sure we've carefully accounted for all the functional form issues given that passengers seem to have these like interior optimum and nonlinear preferences about safety. 
So the conclusion, though, is the myth that modern marketplaces provide lower quality at lower cost is rejected in the data, at least at this example. And broadly, the collection of activities, even though I can't completely sort them out, monitorings, ratings, reviews, nudges, personal interaction, seem to be compensating for the ex ante screening. And when I, when I think about it, of course, you know, I've had many, many scary taxi rides. I have never reported any of them. If I did report them, I'm sure that they wouldn't have any effect, which is why I don't report them. And so it was very plausible to me that you know, basically a system that has any ex post monitoring and ex post incentives could, could um, potentially improve on that as long as the ability differences are not, um, are not too great. So that's it. Thank you very much. Awesome. Questions? Uh, in the back. Is that David? David? Yeah. That was awesome, Susan. Um, I have lots of questions, but uh, um, hmm. maybe just in regards to the way the feedback mechanism works. So I once had a scary Uber drive, and I complained, and I said that it felt dangerous, and they went through a red light. I mean, are you, are you saying that, off the record, that Uber doesn't terminate people more more quickly than after the 20 bad, than after the 4.4 average? Sure, no, so there, there are other, I, I, sh I oversimplified and I went fast, so there are other mechanisms they have as well and those kinds of complaints kind of get special treatment. So I'm talking about what's happening in the normal course of, you know, a little faster, a little slower, a little swervy, a little jerky. And then one of the really quick one, um, in your data you may already know from Uber whether the, the citizenship, the education, the demographics and things are different of the, the taxi drivers versus the Uber drivers? Yes, yeah, so there's many things that are different. There's also an another thing we're exploring is the fact that the Uber drivers own their cars, and so we're trying to actually look at like the quality of the car is another um, possible driver. We're gonna definitely keep exploring those things. Some of them, if, they, if all the Uber drivers are the same in, in a way that's different from the Uber taxis, so there's no possible way I can sort that out. But so I have to look for things where there's actually variation within the Uber drivers or ac across the two to, to tease those out. But I sort of feel like I'm not going to get a full accounting at the end. Like at the beginning, I hoped for a full accounting, and once I sat down, it, it, I, I'm, it's probably hopelessly naive that I'm going to fully account for all of it. Awesome. So there's going to be lots more time for questions during the panel. Thank you very much, uh, Susan. I'm impressed by your adept use of the word driver in your causal analysis there. <laughs> Um, so next up will be uh, Renee Gosslein from MIT. Um, let's welcome her. Thank you. Hello. Can you hear me? Hi, everybody. So um, I would like to talk to you today about zero UI and how it can help patients who outsource their decisions the way that we outsource decisions to technology. But I want to get the elephant out of the way, the elephant in the room. I'm different than most people in this room in one key way. I'm a behavioral person. So be nice. Um, there will not be a lot of numbers in this deck. But not because I don't like numbers. I do like numbers. I am here at MIT. But because this is work that we're developing uh, to release into the field. So I'm very much looking forward to getting the people in the room's ideas and thoughts if you see any sort of uh, areas that we can explore before we release this, this research. So as a behavioral person, um, there's been lots of talk about behavioral economics and nudges. In fact, it was mentioned in the last talk. And thinking from that perspective, here, what I tend to do at the IDE is take the sort of technological approach and marry it with the behavioral approach to understand how people make decisions and how we can improve their decisions using technology. So I do this kinds of, these kinds of things via experiments where people use digital products to learn or to manage their money, or where people use uh, social media platforms to share information with one another about their product experiences. But now I'd like to focus primarily on the experience of the patient. And in particular, a kind of patient who is in their 30s or 40s and has been diagnosed with a chronic illness. So we're talking about a chronic illness, something along the lines of perhaps chronic kidney disease or uh, MS. And how we can help these patients with technology better manage their health and how we can use algorithms to be predictive about the peaks and valleys that they may experience as they're managing their illness. So that's the backdrop and the phenomenon, if you will. 
So I'm going to ask a quick question. You see this here, thinking about diseases and thinking about health. What's the first thing that comes to mind when you see this image? Breast cancer. Um, and so I would imagine if I took a poll in the room, it would be almost 100% with the same response. So very good, A plus. Now take a look at this next uh, set of images here. What comes to mind? Ice bucket challenge or ALS? Very good, we did not rehearse this. You are answering this off the cuff and you are getting this correct. All right, so indeed those are the correct associations and your associations are very tightly sort of bound with these illnesses, likely because you've been exposed to these kinds of images via social media primarily. The ALS ice bucket challenge went viral and then went on to raise millions of dollars for an illness that was relatively not top of mind or as well known prior. And so this raises two questions for us, right? The first is, how do these kinds of images in the viral space affect behaviors, not just of potential donors like yourselves, but of the patients themselves? And then the next thing is, how can we use technology, and particularly zero UI, to nudge better, more compliant health? And the reason why these two things are important for us to think about is because there right now is a chasm between what patients should do and what they actually do, right? So let me give you a little bit of flavor of the patient experience. The data collected on the patient is almost entirely result, uh, reliant upon self-report, right? So the question you go in to see the doctor every few months, let's say, and the doctor says, have you been exercising, eating right, taking your medication? Now, I don't know about you, but we know limitations of oftentimes of surveys when people are asked questions where the answer has a clear, correct answer in terms of how you should be behaving. There often is a gap between what people say and what they actually do, right? This is why it's very difficult for us to understand black market activity, crimes, and things of this nature. Well, health is kind of sort of the same way, particularly because we have cross-sectional data that we use to uh, prescribe, but also because people tend to use data based on means, based on averages. So this is what the average patient responds to. But with these chronic illnesses, there may be individual differences. So looking at that first issue of stigma, which is very important and one of the reasons why we believe zero UI is a better direction, and I'll explain what that is in a minute. This, we've done some research in the past where we've shown people three kinds of imagery for patients, right? And we've done experiments online with viral ice bucket challenge type of uh, settings. Now, this is for Carlson's disease, which actually is not a real disease. <laughs> and fortunately, none of our participants revealed that they had Carlson's disease. But of course, if we had, we would have dumped their data anyway. Um, but what we did is we took a behavioral twist on this where um, we were able to actually get people to engage in perspective taking. And essentially, we showed people these image, this imagery and we assigned them to one of two conditions. Right? So if you were a female participant, you saw the images on the top row. If you're a male participant, you saw the images on the bottom row. And you were assigned to either Pers have, engage in a perspective-taking exercise that made you think of yourself as a potential supporter or donor toward Carlson's disease, or you were uh, assigned to the condition where you were asked to take the perspective of someone who actually has been diagnosed with Carlson's disease. And so this activity asked you to talk about how you would spend your day, what you would do, how you would feel, etc. To also give you a little bit of flavor of this, Carlson's disease was given a profile of stage two melanoma. And in this case, the chronicity of it is important, but also the notion that you could actually affect change if you follow doctor's orders, right? But it was serious enough that you couldn't just sort of, you know, not pay attention to it. So there really was some effect that you could have. And we, could, we asked people a variety of questions, and essentially what we found was this bifurcation between patients and supporters, where consistent with previous research for potential donors, sad faces, the faces that are on the right here, are significantly more likely to lead to donations. However, it's quite different if you are the patient. For patients, high self-efficacy images, as depicted on the left, are more likely to make people feel like they actually have better control over their disease and engage in behaviors that are 
uh, overcoming stigma. For instance, if you ask people to wear a medical alert piece of jewelry, and they can choose between one that's a bracelet and visible to other people, or one that's a necklace that can be hidden from others, knowing that the necklace might be more difficult for emergency personnel to find in the case of a medical emergency. So I give you that backdrop to go forward into what we're doing right now around Zero UI. And I mentioned Zero UI, and you might be thinking, well, what is that? Okay. So thinking about what we do now, currently the technology we have and the Internet of Things, right? Well, two things we currently do. The first thing we do is we have um, interfaces that require action, conscious interaction, right? So on the bottom right, Alexa, order some new paper towel, right? Or pick up your phone and say, Siri, call my husband. Or augmented reality or wearables where there is some conscious interaction, right? The other thing that we have going on is a real great emphasis on big data, which love big data. But one of the things that Zero UI is doing is moving toward deeper data. And that Zero UI really is about data that's personalized to you. So you can see in the top right, for instance, Motorola's tattoo, which right now is allowing you to interf uh, interface with your phone more easily. But in the healthcare realm, we have tattoos that are picking up your body temperature, picking up other types of biostatistics, as well as motion, activity, and so on. So that we can better understand after eating a meal that may be off of your prescribed diet, whether there are increases in your uh, bioconductivity and other types of, of measurements, right? And then, of course, on the bottom left there, you see the eye uh, contact lens that is a lot less sort of uh, conscious or, or interruptive than, let's say, a traditional Google Glass, right? Where we can have this lens see what you're seeing and enhance or augment your activities and your behaviors. Now, the partner that we have that's working with us on this research, I'm not at liberty to describe the actual zero UI uh, technology that we're using, but suffice to say that the point is that you, not, you don't have to engage consciously in managing or collecting your data. And that gets us over one huge hurdle, which is this hurdle about going to the doctor and telling them how much you've been resting, how much you've been eating, how much you've been drinking, and things of that nature. The other co cool thing about this is moving away from necessarily big data into deeper data allows us to help people who don't cluster around the mean in terms of their disease profile. And there are many, many of peop uh, people who do this. This also helps with the stigma, because for these people who are in their 30s and 40s, feeling like they are a patient and sort of be a beacon to the world with that is a problem. So, our experimental approach. Um, the possibilities are great, but the reason why we're taking a behavioral approach in addition to using these algorithms um, and, and this technology is because we can have all of the medications in the world that, that are helpful, but if no one's taking them, well, then they might, not, might as well not exist. And so understanding when people feel comfortable abdicating their privacy or their control to a zero UI device versus when they feel like, I want to be the one to make the decision. And how we can build self-efficacy in patients so that they don't feel like they're just being told what to do every time they go to the physician, but rather they are taking an active and involved step in managing their health. So thinking about the, disease, the, the experiment here, um, there are three key variables that we're testing. The first is the stage of your disease. So, one of the things you notice here is there are stages one to five. This is for chronic kidney disease, and this is uh, the GFR, which is a measure of basically how well your kidneys are filtering, right? The kidneys are the sanitation workers, if you will, of the body. They filter out all of the toxins. So the first is the stage of the disease, whether you've been more recently diagnosed, whether you're further along in your diagnosis and things of that nature. The second is patient's, patient agency and control. So we will be manipulating the degree to which people feel and see imagery that makes them feel like they have high self-efficacy, right? So there have been experiments in the past that have done things where you open up your phone and there's a smiley face or a sad face, 
and that sort of indicates you're late for something or have a good day, you can take this run, you can do it. We'll be doing things of that nature as well. And then last but not least, uh, sort of uh, setting people into two, two buckets with whether or not they're actually going to be interacting with a more traditional platform, in this case an app. We've gotten to the point where apps are considered traditional. Um, or with a zero, zero UI platform that just collects the data from them without their reporting anything or interacting. No uh, email inbox, no app, no notifications, nothing like that. And then we have these data that will be shared with the physician um, or if the patients choose to do so, they can share them with people in their social networks. So this is what we have underway. The research is kind of in the earlier uh, stage, if you will, but um, as the previous presenter said, research doesn't always um, adhere to conference deadlines. But um, we're really excited about pursuing this and hopefully helping people with their uh, managing their illnesses. And so I'm looking forward to hearing any thoughts that you may have about the design. Thank you. We can take a clarifying question or one question while we switch. No question. Okay, so we're gonna we're gonna move on to Ron. There he is. So next up is uh, Ronnie Kohavi from Microsoft. Oops. Thank you. Okay, so um, I'm gonna talk about metric pitfalls. Uh, I just tweeted that URL if you're interested in the slides. I know that the online drive doesn't have them, so it's cool to, if you need that. And I'll just say that this is based on a KDD paper by several folks from my team. If you're interested in reading more, uh, there's the link. I want to start just telling you one slide about the team so you understand the context. Uh, I run this team called the Analysis and Experimentation at Microsoft. We have this mission to accelerate innovation using through trustworthy analysis and experimentation. And we joke that we empower the hippo, you know, the highest paid person opinion with the data. Uh, we're about 90 people, uh, including software developers, data scientists, and program managers. And the key thing is that we built this platform initially on Bing, an online property. We scaled it beautifully. They're now running about 1,200 controlled experiment treatments every month. Um, and each of them has millions of users. So a pretty large system. And in the last three years, what we did is we started to scale this platform so that it can handle a lot more properties at Microsoft. I gave a whole bunch of them from MSN to Office, Cortana, Skype, Outlook, et cetera. And if you're interested, there's an HBO article that just came out last month with uh, Stefan Tomke. There's copies outside, or here's the URL. So um, lots of these pitfalls are basically derived from lots and lots of experiments. And so hopefully, you, I'm going to share just three of them. There's 12 in the actual paper. Before I go into the pitfalls, I want to give you one important data point that will serve us later, which is the importance of session metrics. Um, why, this is a metric that we focus a lot on. It's a very, very unique metric in many ways. But I'll just start with this one example um, from Bing, which is we evaluate Bing on two things, really. It's query share, what percent of queries, say, in the US come to Bing versus Google and other search engines, um, and of course, how much revenue we generate as a long-term goal. Now here's the, the reason why things get interesting. We have a bug in the ranking engine. We start to show poor results. Um, what do you think happens? Well, queries go up by 10%. Right? And that's because users have to reformulate the query. The results are not as good. And then revenue goes up by 30%, so we're making a lot more money. Because ads that are not impacted by the bug suddenly look a lot better than the poor results that we're displaying. So, um, so what's wrong here? Like you, you think about this and like, okay, we have two major goals and if we measure them, um, we basically should fire the relevance team. And by the way, the, the, the second line is real. Our query share has gone up from 8% in 2009 when being launched to 23% uh, and we're profitable. So it's not because we fired the relevance team, it's because we didn't rely on those metrics. Um, and so here's the, the simple decomposition that I've uh, shared in some, some papers. If you look at queries per month, it really splits into queries per session, sessions per users, and users per month. You can see things cancel out. It's a very simple equation. And the point is we actually want to minimize 
the queries per session. Okay, so whereas users come into our site, they have a task, they have a session, we want to minimize the number of queries they have to do, as we want to maximize sessions per user, and then the third term, because of the experiment design, usually turns out to be uh, exactly the same if you run it properly. So sessions per user is sort of our North Star. This is what we want to look at all the time, um, and there's lots of complications with that. Um, but one of the things that comes out of it is in order to understand this, we built a whole slew of metrics around sessions, how many queries you've got, the time to success in a session, uh, which is a boolean, sorry, which is a time, and then the boolean itself, which is did you have a successful click or not? There's some definitions of that. So the first observation I want to make, really trivial, but an important one, if sessions per user as a metric changes, then all your session level metrics are invalid. Right, so remember, we have this like time to success and things like that. All those become involved. And the reason this is important is we show people scorecards. Right? A typical scorecard at Bing is 2,000 metrics. And people you know, look for those highlighted ones that are stat sig. But if sessions per user changed, then all these metrics that rely on session are going to be invalid. Um, and so just think about you know, an easy way to move sessions per user just to change the sessionization algorithm. Today, we look for a 30-minute gap. If you change this to a 20-minute gap in the treatment, everything is going to be off. All the metrics are going to move, but it means nothing. Um, now, this is an important statement. Sessions per user is a really, really, really hard metric to move. You know, we run 10,000 experiments every year, 15,000 experiments. Every year, about two or three of them move the metric positively, right? So you have problems with like false positives. We try to replicate if it happens. Really hard metric to move before. Uh, one of the talks said, well, run something, and if, if, it, you know, if you need to extend the time that you run it. It turns out with sessions per user, if you run the experiment longer, the variance doesn't go down. Really surprising. In, in fact, even though you're admitting more users into the experiment, the variance of the mean goes up just as fast as you're admitting users in. So really annoying metric to move. Um, but so let's look at some applications. If you have pages per user, very common metric that we have in experiments. Everybody looks at this. There's a whole slew of click-through metrics. But if pages per user changes, stop, all the click-through metrics are invalid. Right? And a good example of that is implemented, MSN implemented this refresh. So if you don't touch the page for a few minutes, they refresh the page automatically. Well, from a user perspective, it may be good. They get, you know, the news gets updated, other things. But all the click-through metrics are just you know, completely, completely irrelevant now because you're now refreshing the page a lot often, so all the metrics go down. So you know, one thing you can say is if the denominator changes between control and treatment, then Everything is invalid. Um, so let's look at a result that's related to us, which was puzzling. So we open links in a new tab. Okay, and the classical example of that, let's see if the pointer works, is here's the, the outlook.com link. You click on that. Instead of opening Outlook in place, we open it in a new tab in the browser. And we reported way back that, wow, this was one of the most successful experiments, huge benefits for doing that. And the simple reason is when users are done with their email, they kill the tab, yet suddenly, so what happens now is basically MSN shows up again, and maybe they'll click on another place. So we had a recent experiment. People you know, liked the idea of opening a tab, and they tried this on other things, like news articles. And we got this amazingly surprising result that there was an increase, which is in, you know, a terrible degradation, in page load time. Right? So why would things get slower when you open news articles in a new tab? Give you a few seconds to think about that. This is similar to the click-through rate, but it's less obvious. What happens is, there are now fewer pages in the treatment. So the, in control users, they read the news article, they're done, they either hit the back button or click home again to see MSN. But in the treatment, there is no back button. We just open a new tab, the browser doesn't offer us the back button. So users kill the tab and go back to the home page that way. right? And so the, the issue is that reloading the home page the second time is faster because all the elements are cached, everything is faster. 
But because we threw away those pages, we're not counting them in the average, it looks like things slowed down. Of course, this is all an artifact. There's nothing real here. The users are actually having a better experience. Our metrics are just wrong in this case. Um, OK, the topic that everybody loves in this conference, heterogeneous treatment effect. <laughs> Every speaker last time I remember talked about it. I talked about it too. So of course, we're doing this, right? So we started to tell users, hey, here's a beautiful segment that is different than the rest. Have a look at this. And so we ran this experiment, and it shows a static positive treatment effect to sessions per user. Remember, sessions per user is like the North Star that we can never move. And so, you know, normally such a huge case is such a, a case is huge cause for celebration. Um, and what more than that, it was two segments that things improved. And the two segments were mutually exclusive and exhaustive. These were the only two segments. Big double celebration, right? Only we noticed that the average treatment effect overall did not move. Okay, so you got a metric that doesn't move, but the two segments that compose it both move positively. What's going on? Okay, so there's a famous story, uh, no political motives, but when the president ended his presidency and moved from Washington, D.C. to Texas, the IQ in both D.C. and Texas went up. <laughs> right? And there is no problem, right? This is possible. There's nothing wrong with it. Um, it's a variant of Simpson's paradox. Um, all you have to say is that his IQ has to be lower than the average in DC and higher than in the home state. And so you can see that you know, when you move him out of DC, the average goes up. You move them into Texas, boom, also moves up. <laughs> right? right? And this is exactly what happened to us. We shifted users from one segment to another, right? And basically caused both of the segment averages to go up. So you have to be really, really careful about heterogeneous treatment effects. Because you have to look and make sure that you don't do this. Now, some people say, oh, prevent this. You cannot allow segments that would be impacted by the treatment. And it's just too restrictive to us. Almost everything that we're interested in could potentially be interested, be impacted by the treatment. And so we have to add a detection algorithm, which is what we do today. So if there's a shift of users from one segment to another, we basically fire what's called a sample ratio mismatch and don't allow all the metrics underneath it to basically be valid. But that's a really, really tough lesson. We've made this mistake. You know, it took us a while to realize that we're seeing these effects. That are bogus. Uh, and by the way, this is something interesting. It's a sort of an app store trick. I don't know how many of you realize this, but this is a beautiful example of how to move users from one um, segment to another. Think about your, you know, you're writing an app, and people rate you, and the rating's not that good. And so you think about this thing. There are users that rate you high, four to five stars. There are users that rate you low, one to three stars. And there are users that don't rate you at all. What if instead of just working hard on the app, which is really hard to improve, what if you just move those guys from one to three stars into the do not rate me? Right? Then your average would go up, right? And it turns out everybody does it these days. So your typical experience is they ask you a question that correlates it. Are you enjoying this? Yes. How about you rate us? But if you say no, would you mind giving us feedback? You have no option to rate them. Right? You will start to notice, now that you've seen this, everybody does it now. Even the packages that now you can add to allow users to rate do this trick so that you all, you'll get a higher, a higher score at the App Store. Um, OK, the last pitfall is basically ignoring Twyman's law. Um, here's a cool example where you know, people said, oh, you know, we all got this Outlook. In Windows, we now have this mail app, and we're going to change from opening it in the web to open it in the, uh, in the app. And the result was a 28 increase in the number of clicks and a 27% increase in the number of clicks on the button adjacent to it. So on this guy, and people were like coming up with all these beautiful explanations how this shifted left and look at this amazing experiment. Um, and so this is Twyman's law, 
which it says basically anything looks interesting or different is usually wrong. Too big of a difference, stop, figure out what's wrong. And this is exactly what we figure here. You know, the graph diminishes really, really fast over time. So even though they ran it for several days, the average was diminishing really quickly. And we were looking at users being completely confused. They were like used to clicking on it, getting their web interface to Outlook. And now this app comes up. They, they tried multiple times, right? But over time, they learned not to click and to go directly. And so, you know, you have to be really careful. We're biased to like celebrate when we have a good result. Um, if something looks too good to be true, then investigate. OK, so these are the, the 12 rules in the actual paper, if you want to see them. Um, you know, experiment system should be able to detect such common things. And we're adding more and more into our system so that we're able to alert. Um, and just have this skepticism, triangulate results. Uh, if something looks too good, you know, stop it. And then drill down into segments. It is very, very useful for doing it. Thank you. All right, question for Ron. There's one right over here. Michael. Are you doing a formal review of metrics, or are these simply emergent phenomena that you observe and comment on? Um, so when we onboard a new team, we work with them to try and come up with a, what we call the OEC, the overall evaluation criteria. We want to make sure we address the things like that I shared with you in Bing. They don't come up with some metric that they think is good, but measured in the short term is not predictive of the long term. After that, they're on their own a lot, right? So just to give you a sense of how you know, crazy things are on Bing, every month they add about 150 metrics to the set of metrics that you can choose from, right? <laughs> Big numbers are happening. This is why scorecards have thousands of metrics at times. Um, and most of the time, it's OK. It's like they're measuring the, their feature. They're building things around it. But at the end of the day, you have to limit yourself to shipping based on a few set of really critical features that we audit and we test and we trust more. Yeah, but great question. Yeah. OK, let me invite Susan and Renee up to, uh, to have our panel. And uh, I know there were tons of hands after uh, Susan's talk. And I, if you guys remember your questions, Raise your hands again, because the microphone has to sort of get to you. So there's one over here. Uh, other questions, just raise your hand. There's one right here. Alex, go on. There's a mic right behind you. All right. So uh, I won't intervene. I'll go straight to the, the hands that have been getting sore raised. <laughs> uh, hi. Uh, my question is for Susan. Uh, you mentioned that. Uh, how it's, it's, it's really hard to reach the 4.4 uh, for the driver uh, so they would be kicked out. To what degree do you think the driver uh, perceive this uh, fact? So for example, maybe, I, I mean, given that the driver also don't see the ratings, so maybe I'm driving really well all the time, but then like I get, like, I feel like I probably had like three bad uh, experiences and maybe now I feel like I'm very close to 4.4 even though I am not. Uh, but this could have higher impact on me, uh, like improving my, uh, regardless of whether how far I am. Yeah, I think it's a really interesting question. And actually, one of my colleagues is also working with Uber Data on another project. And he's looking at disparities between different types of drivers, like gender differences and so on, and finds that there are disparities. But some of that has to do with learning. So that if, if one group tends to churn more often than another, the group that stays the longest um, tends to perform better in Uber because they learn all sorts of things. And you don't think it's that hard to be an Uber driver, but just figuring out where to go and how to make your customers happy. So I think actually one, one reason, not just that it makes a pretty economics paper, but it would also in some sense be more long-term generalizable if I can account for more of why the drivers are doing what they're doing. Because I do agree that one explanation is that right now they're just kind of confused. You know, they don't really know. And, and part of it is, of course, Uber is changing all the time, which gives us variation to learn stuff. But, you know, they don't, they kind of know that Uber can see their driving, but they're not really sure how it's being used and under what conditions they'll get kicked off. So they're like on their best behavior just because it sort of feels like Big Brother's watching in some kind of a, you know, um, unknown way. But they, if over time they really figured out that they could perform less well, 
um, they might learn and, and, and have their performance fall off. Now, presumably at that point, the company would then tighten their limits and it, you, know, you would get to an equilibrium where you keep the drivers behaving the way you want them to through nudges and so on. But I guess just from a static uh, perspective, if I try to interpret my results, it's certainly a, a, a possible explanation that, that, that the drivers think that they're at more risk than they are, both on the safety and on the ratings. So also a question for Susan, and maybe connecting with Ron's talk about pitfalls, right? So you observe that when drivers get a warning or have a bad trip before, they're more likely to perform better now. So that reminds me to the original kind of setting of the F F-16 pilot uh, Top Gun uh, training, that every time when a, uh, a supervisor gave a, a stern warning, you had a bad one, the next one was better. And analysis showed it was just regression towards the mean. Right? So, so to what extent does your instrumental variables approach guard against this being just a regression towards the mean uh, explanation? Yes, yeah, so th the reason we use the IV approach was exactly because of that concern. So we're basically regressing your current rating on other people's ratings. And so that I mean, presumably... I think he's saying something yeah, else. Maybe but, I'll try to say. Yeah. If you ran an experiment where somebody who went down to 4.5 did not get a warning, would they also go up? just because they're going to regress to the mean, right, to a higher rating. Right. Yeah, so, so I think that that is totally a concern. Um, but they're, right now what I'm looking at is, again, the, the change in their rating from the change in what happens to other drivers, which I think cleans that out. Um, but if you, have some, if, you, if you have a mind, a mechanism where that's not true, uh, let me know. Alex? Um, cool, yeah, this was a really cool set of talks. Um, and I guess I wanted to ask about like industry and social science collaborations um, because, you know, when, when you have an industry talk uh, for like a machine learning conference, you know, someone comes and says, look, we have this system that works really well and, and that's great. With social science, it's a little bit different because, you know, you like, you say, well, we have to test this hypothesis that Uber is maybe doing this bad thing or not, um, and you find that that you know that myth is false. Um, but if you had found out that it was true, then would they have let you publish any of this? <laughs> and and, so, and, and so, I, I mean, like, how do we think about the fact that there's going to be this positive selection by legal PR, et cetera, um, in any industry social science setting? That's a great question, and you know, I used to run a lot of triage for people using Microsoft data and also thought a lot about that. So what I tended to do there was to try to steer people away from topics where, where it would seem highly conflicted and where there, it was not necessarily very objective. So I don't think that we generally think that we're all making up our data because, of course, anybody who runs experiments could make up their data in the end. Um, but there are a lot of assumptions that go into modeling and so on. And so I think that if you're going to do something that is looking more um, like it matters to the company what the result is, then it's useful if the methodology is sort of fairly clear and, and fairly objective. Um, and so at least you, know, you can release the code and understand what people did and also maybe give semi-synthetic data that would allow people to explore things. I think for this particular one, um, I had seen an, a, a small experiment that had been done by someone else um, where they actually put people into taxis. And it had actually come out very strong that uh, the Uber drivers were safer, which kind of conformed with my priors. And so I wasn't that worried that I was going to be told I couldn't publish it. Uh, because it seemed likely to be, um, that seemed like an unlikely occurrence. Um, but I think that broadly, we do have to be careful and like, you know, trying to say, like, have somebody write a paper that says, like, there was no market power for Windows or something. You know, I, I didn't really want to encourage people to try to write those kinds of papers because it would sort of undermine the integrity of the whole. Uh, Enterprise. I mean, you know, back when Windows did, did have market power. <laughs> I would love to speak to that as well. I think it starts with the research question. If the research question is narrow and it seems like it's more of a consulting question, 
I think that's when you sort of back off. But at least in the medical realm, I think the desire is to avoid anything that could be potentially harmful. So if you were, I think it's a little different than perhaps what a brand might find where it's like, okay, our sales won't be as high or our clicks won't be as high. To learn that something might actually not be beneficial to patients is important, I think, to know. And so the hope is that um, the transparency and the rigor. Uh, yeah, I think the cigarette companies prove you wrong on that right. point. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, I, I they, guess. They had all the research for many, many years. Well, suppressing, to ignore them, right, yeah. suppressing is different. But I mean, in terms of designing an experiment, if you're, if you're being rigorous and objective, I, I think it starts with the question, um, so. And as I think, I mean, in the end, if Uber saw that you know their incentives weren't working and they weren't getting high quality, then they also have a desire to right. improve. Right. I mean, they're improving it constantly. They're testing more and more feedback. So, I, I, I kind of agree that there's sort of a, a space where, like, if you're if you're selling things that kill people, then probably like, yeah, that's not a great one to collaborate with. <laughs> <laughs> um, right. That's a good rule just in general. <laughs> Don't sell things that kill people. <laughs> I, I actually want to I want to add to that because I feel like we could have an entire panel on this question. Yeah. Uh, this is and Ronnie's alluding to this, which is that <clears throat> we have an issue here where industry has a tremendous amount of research and development going on inside the walls of the organization. And certainly the external transparency into those results is incredibly cherry picked and sort of uh, you know, um, uh, there's a huge selection bias in terms of what exits the, the research halls inside the uh, institution and comes out, uh, and, <clears throat> and also what they're willing to collaborate on and so on. I think that's an issue as more and more research is being done inside, inside organizations that are not academic um, institutions. The, I, I've, I've dealt with this in a number of cases, uh, one thing to do, instead of selecting the question based on whether or not it is a high likelihood, I mean, as, a, as an advisor, I worry about a student who's doing a project that can then get shut down. Instead of selecting the questions based on what could or could not be shut down, is or is not sensitive, and so on and so forth, uh, which I think is also sort of uh, a, a big, the same selection bias, but in a different stage of the, the design process, um, is, to, is to think differently about the, the formulation of the question itself. So instead of asking, does such and such a technique work or not work, you might want to uh, have uh, heterogeneous treatment effects come to the rescue again and ask the question, <laughs> under what conditions right. is it more or less valuable uh, under what conditions uh, is it most likely to work best, and so on. And, and, and that way, you can still report the tale of the distribution where it's, it's not helpful or maybe hurt, hurtful. Uh, but you can essentially ask the same question and also give the academic audience a much more rich answer to the question that you were trying to ask to begin with. Yeah, so getting out the mechanisms. Yeah. I would say, I mean, this is probably like the, the, pa the paper I've written that is the most aligned with an interest or not interest of a company, because yeah. most of the stuff I did for Microsoft, like I, I was working on news, which was just orthogonal to their interests, mm -hmm. and that kept it cleaner. But I do think that, you know, on the other hand, I, it's these, these, these problems are important. The data is amazing. And we don't want to sort of beat down the firms that are actually opening it up and letting us ask the questions and get at the mechanisms and run the experiments. And I would say that it's not as new a problem as you would think. I mean, people who liked school choice wrote about school choice. You know, people who cared about small class size would try to run experiments for small class size. You know, people who cared about the minimum wage were looking for specific examples of minimum wage changes. You know, so, so the fact that researchers have been motivated by policy in some way and have chosen their experimental designs and chosen which things to do goes way back. You know, people who believe in free markets tend to write papers and find industries with no market power, and so on. So I think over all this time, you know, we reveal our conflicts, and, and, and people kind of have to assess the research on some trust and quality. 
Yeah, I mean, just uh, just one final point on that. Uh, and if you have a question, please raise your hand so you can get the uh, the microphone. One final point on that is that I think one thing uh, that I've noticed is that uh, there are very strange trade-offs made within these uh, industrial research organizations about the inevitability of these things becoming public and the cost benefit of sort of a lack of transparency in the short term followed by a, a, you know a full transparency in the long term when a better strategy might have been to quote unquote get out ahead of it uh, by doing this research with academic mm -hmm. institutions and saying look you know none of what we're doing is easy to sort of uh, orchestrate an entire say community of two billion people so we're constantly trying to make things better and so you know we've been researching you know say fake news for a long time uh, instead of keeping it under wraps we're gonna make it transparent well, well, actually, I want to continue on this team. Just one, one more question, maybe, because um, uh, the section bias has certainly been a, a issue for a long time. But given how much more power we have to do experiments and massive numbers of experiments, then I think selection bias almost inevitably becomes a bigger issue um, and can swamp a lot of the other things that, that we're talking about. And I'd be interested to hear from the panelists if you think there are any institutional things we can do to improve it. I mean. One go-to solution um, that uh, a lot of economists would go to is, is this is a public goods issue, and maybe there should be some um, uh, mandates that certain kinds of experiments need to be done, and that, that we don't want to only have one kind of experiment done. But that seems very heavy-handed. Are there other things we can do, other kinds of institutions or norms we can set up to try to um, uh, get those experiments done that uh, wouldn't otherwise see the, day of light, the light of day? <laughs> well, one thought I, I think, you know, obviously I'm a bit biased because I am at the IDE, but I think that having organizations where um, there's a sort of porous wall between the organizations that are supporting the research and the academic uh, organization um, is important because I think when those issues do arise, the pushback is from market or industry concerns, right? And, and from an academic standpoint, you're concerned about getting to the truth or the correct answer. However, if you can bring some of those people into your world on a regular basis, either by, you know, here at the IDE, we have people from industry who are on site for periods of time, that sort of thing. I think that that helps with the norms, the practices, and the values of, um, understanding that you're not just looking for yes or no answers, but what are the circumstances under which this occurs versus that? I think when there's this sort of distance between industry and academia, then you have these very different cultures um, and, and it becomes sort of which one will win during collaboration as opposed to perhaps um, uh, addressing you know, or, or influencing each other. Whereas academicians, we're not just doing stuff that is just interesting to a very small group of people, um, but not really having an impact. But also, uh, as industry people, you're thinking about the truth and getting to high quality, rigorous result, and not just what's going to affect the bottom line this quarter. And so maybe, I think we may also be slightly overstating like how much is secret. I mean, certainly my attitude around the search engine was that you, th there was a few things like that were really secret. Like we would have, Bing would have loved to know these things about Google, Google, maybe if they noticed, would have liked to know them about Bing. But you know, we, we, we you know, you there were there were certainly <laughs> some things that were them were secret. <laughs> but you know, a lot of things are just not secret. And I mean, one thing I would tell the ads team as part of a, a, a like, you know, don't do anything in the pricing that that you don't want to show up on a blog somewhere. Uh, because ultimately, you know, there's hundreds of people working here. There are interns. There are people from Microsoft Research. You know, people are coming and going, and you know, you you wouldn't really want to have like some terrible secret uh, if, it, if if other pe if people were really interested in it. So yes, there are some things that are kept secret, but it's it's kind of a smaller collection. And I, I sort of feel that all most of the companies, I same same with Uber. You know, they don't have. Um, you know, it's, it, it, the broad outlines of what they're doing are public. I mean, when they run an experiment on the drivers, like the drivers know that. Like when they change the prices, it's in the newspaper. So this isn't really that secret. 
Other questions? I was making a joke. Of course, <laughs> Google would have loved to know all the brilliant algorithms that made us have just as good search results as Google, even though we had less data. I thought you were going to say eight, I thought you were going to say eight percent to twenty three percent. Now they are taking. Those, right? yeah. <laughs> questions? Yes, right here in front. And if you have other questions, raise your hand so the mics can get to you. Uh, so it's a question for Mr. Kohavi. So you were talking about the overall evaluation criteria and the fact that you are having many more teams now uh, using experimentation. Uh, and I was wondering how you, so for example, let's say Xbox experiments and, and Bing experiments. So, well, in that case, it's maybe not, uh, but how do you handle like when these sub departments, they have conflicting evaluation criteria. So for example, when it's pulling in one direction, the other one is pulling in the other. Did you manage to somehow have one that you can yeah, share so across? Uh... The, the conflicts usually happen within the same group, right? So in Bing, you have the guys working on algorithmic relevance and ads. Yeah, for example, they tend yeah. to be in conflict, and so we have to come up with an OEC that so you know, you manage addresses that. But Xbox is optimizing something on their own, and Office is optimizing on their own. The hard part is to come up with what is the metric that says that users of Word have a better day. You know, it's a hard thing to, to come up with, right? And this is where we're spending our time coming up with OECs for those. I, I don't think there's any sort of assumption that Bing and Office interact enough for us to care. But for They're example, Excel, Excel and Word or whatever, for example, you, you, that's within the same, uh, because that's, that's one problem that we encounter a lot. So we have several sub-departments, right? And they push in different directions, right? Right, that's and what I said. In the same group, you may have these, and that's, this is where the OEC discussions are important, to say how are we gonna sort out the fact that you know, Bing ads wants to put a lot of ads and relevance wants to have zero ads. There has to be some trade-off equation and we have that. Okay. Hi, um, I was really curious, uh, Renee, about a few things you said about, um, I guess, health consumers and patients control over their data and those questions about how much agency you give them. Um, have you or are you planning to do experiments that actually test the outcomes of different levels of agency and control over data and, and those kinds of things? Yes, that's exactly um, what we're going to be manipulating in terms of how much control or agency you have over it. And then we will be testing the outcomes. And there are multiple dependent variables, obviously many health metrics involved, but also behavioral variables with regard to the frequency with which you contact your nurse. So much, most of these patients are assigned someone who's on their case. And typically, the problem is that they don't engage the nurse assigned to their case frequently. Um, and there are some really sort of psychological issues behind that, including the fact that perhaps the nurse doesn't understand what it's like to live with the illness, but also um, they prefer to leave well enough alone if they haven't had a flare in, a, in, in you know enough in, in a recent uh, period of time. So behavioral measures like uh, the frequency with which they contact their healthcare providers, um, as well as we're creating other types of metrics. Uh, one of the things we're, um, and we don't know if it's going to work, but one of the things we're uh, working on now is having a metric not unlike um, the pollen count. So if you have seasonal allergies, if you check the weather, there'll often be a metric that says, you know, the pollen count or, the, you know, the, the hay fever score is X. So better stay inside or whatever the, I don't have seasonal allergies, so I don't know what the, the recommendation is. But... Um, if we can create something that's uh, based on a variety of these measures that we collect that gives them a very sort of tactile, easily understood score that helps them manage their lives, we're looking to see whether that score provides more knowledge and therefore um, better adherence to doctor protocols. And could you see them doing their own experiments, like citizen behavioral scientists? <laughs> this, the, the, the patients themselves, I would love that. I would love a day where the patient um, gets such uh, personalized and accurate feedback where he or she could say, you know, when I eat foods that are high in sodium, I notice immediately changes in my blood levels, right? Or I notice that when I go running, there is an improvement in my blood pressure. I think if we could front load those results and those benefits from a behavioral standpoint, they'd be far more likely to get people in behaviors that are taking care of their health, as opposed to, you should do this now because things will be better when you're 70, which is currently how things are talked about. Just to follow up on 
Hank, there's a mic coming. Oh, just to follow up with what you just said, um, isn't this where you know the quantified self meets all these um, sort of um, virtual communities, and that's where the healthcare system really needs to. Uh, yes. and, and this is really a big data problem. You know, I yeah. was looking at how big data, for instance, should be very useful for predicting cancer, like metastasizing. So precisely, I think that's right. I think, however, to add a sort of more to the sort of notion of big data. Um, I, I think what you're saying is right in a more distributed sort of ownership of the patient experience as opposed to being held solely by the physician who sees the patient occasionally, um, having sort of better care this way. But I think in addition to having this, this larger data and those algorithms that predict based on large scale uh, data, I think if we could understand the particularities of your case because oftentimes these things manifest differently. This is certainly the case with cancer, for instance. Um, that could also, I don't think it's an either or, I think it's a both. Uh, but right now we have neither uh, being fully applied. Okay. I was wondering if you have any comments on what kind of efforts there are to kind of think of having groups, larger groups of people or crowds be involved in experimental design. So I just came from a human computer interaction conference on crowdsourcing human computation. So they're really thinking about ways to get larger groups of people involved. And I bet their teams that design these are Microsoft, for example. But experimental paradigms seem like they're really well suited. Like maybe you could set up as a master experimenter. You know, what kind of text do we put in these web pages? What motivational messages do we give people? And then allow people within Microsoft or allow scientists to actually contribute to experimental conditions. So I'm just wondering if there have been efforts to do that, because that seems like it could be a pretty dynamic process. You can add things in, move them out, and then it'd be a way that you get scientists bring behavioral theories from psychology and other areas to bear. You kind of get the collective wisdom. I'll take a swipe of that. Do you know uh, Matt Salganic at Princeton? So uh, he's developed something called uh, Wiki Surveys, which is essentially a crowdsourced survey uh, and his team provides the back-end statistical uh, framework for understanding how the crowdsourced questions and radial answers should be analyzed given the populations from which they're being drawn and so on and so forth. And it's sort of a way that the crowd can create uh, and edit a survey that is actually uh, robust. We'll take one more, and then I'm going to ask a final question of the panel to end. Uh, I wanted to ask, like, uh, we, the digital experiments are generally based on the quantitative metrics. So if you have any experiences, uh, how to uh, get the quantitative metrics and use the qualitative studies to, to verify that, yes, the quantitative results are actually mm -hmm. true and not one of those pitfalls where we are just making wrong decisions? Um, so I'll say this. So in our, in our world, it's the qualitative that's, the, that's considered to be sort of the early phase less reliable. So we have an idea. We're going to test it on, you know, in a small set of people in the lab and see if, you know, filter out your ideas. Based on those, maybe change the design in the beginning. Once we get to the experiment stage, we want it to be precise. So you know, modulo the pitfalls. The assumption is that the control experiment is the highest and the gold standard for things. The other thing that I'll say is one of the data points that we do get is feedback. So when you go, and a lot of our sites have a feedback button, that gets into the experiment as a metric for the count of feedbacks and the, you know, the gradation of the one, two, three, four, five. So if there is a statistically significant difference, we will highlight those automatically for you. So maybe so that's how we merge the two. So just to, to add to that, uh, one of the big themes that I have in, because I usually do experiments in marketplaces, is the, the gap between short-term and long-term metrics. Um, and that's something you know, that has been, like there's a team at Facebook that's worked on it, we worked on it at Microsoft, and so I'm trying to design better long-term experiments. But you can't, you can't do that for everything. So then when you're using um, short-term experiments, for something that has long-term impacts, I think that can be a place where you can layer on additional review. Um, so one thing that I've seen firms do is like have peer review. So for example, you know, if I'm going to put forward an experiment, I'm going to say, OK, here's my experiment. I mean, it's an experiment in a marketplace. But these are the reasons why I think the short-term metrics actually reflect the quality of my initiative. 
Now, if it's something like in an advertising platform, I raised prices for everybody, then no, the short term is not the long term. You know, it's very much not the long term. And so if you have a peer then review that and say, gosh, what did this experiment actually do? This experiment raised prices. This is an example where the short term does not equal to the long term. So before we ship it, we need to do a deeper dive. Um, and, and, and actually, one of the reasons I got motivated by heterogeneous treatment effects in experimental platforms to start with is I think that's another way to do the peer review. It's not, so, not just that you might ship an algorithm just for a subset of the people, but also if you can see, oh, well, this algorithm worked well, but only on auto insurance queries, you know, that, then you have a very different interpretation of what was going on and also whether the short and the long term go together. So I guess my approach to the qualitative stuff is to try to segment things by where, wh where do you need it, where do you not, when you do need it, to try to speed things up, get peer review, and also supplementary metrics that can highlight potential problems, which I think is consistent with a lot of what um, Ronnie was saying as well. I would agree with that. I think um, e you know, each, ha each method, methodological approach has its strengths and its weaknesses, and I think uh, a multi-method or sort of looking at supplementary variables is always always a good thing to understand why we're observing what we're observing. So one last question to each of the panelists in turn. I'll start with Ronnie. What is the birds of a feather networking session topic that you're going to want to go to? This oh, afternoon? that's a, <laughs> let me punt. This, go and Renee first. This is, a, this is a behavioral intervention on my part. Is this an experiment? Yeah, so, 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 so in the morning, we announced that this afternoon uh, at 4.45, because of feedback in the past, we're going to have uh, some optional birds of a feather networking sessions. And we're asking people to uh, write their topic and their name next to it. And if, if you are somebody who sees a topic you like, just to put a prime slash so that we can see how many are interested in each one. And then we're going to organize a few sessions on key topics where people will just go to that room and it will be a free-for-all conversation with whomever, and maybe you'll make some contacts of people who are interested in the same types of things. And this is some feedback we've gotten in the last three years. And so as a behavioral intervention, <laughs> noticing our, our OEC our MP, out yeah. there is, uh, is a little moving. bit, is a little yeah. bit, is not really moving. So I'm hoping to intervene and, and ask our esteemed panelists what their birds of a feather session is going to be. Well, I have to tell you, I have a really good excuse for not putting something up. I was thinking about my talk. <laughs> yes, okay, that's good. An hour good. after the talk, I'll fill one up. <laughs> okay, okay, so you're going to put one up later. We'll let you get away with that. Renee, do you have uh, topics that you're interested in networking with um, people around? Yeah, I took a look at some of the topics. Um, I think the heterogeneous effects thing is covered, um, mm -hmm. so there'll be a lot of people there. Um, so I'm going to do something different. It was covered last year. Yeah, I'm not going to go after door number one. Um, mm -hmm. So I saw something, if I recall correctly, about... Uh, media. And so um, I'm really interested in learning about that. Um, as you can see, based on my talk today, uh, much of uh, patient behaviors um, are shaped prior to even getting diagnosed or even coming to the physician because of exposure in uh, social networks and things of that nature. So um, I'm very much interested in understanding how we can do experiments using these sorts of media to um, inform uh, the kinds of questions that we're all grappling with. Susan? So I haven't looked at the list yet. There's no list. Uh, there, oh, so this is a wiki survey. List. Yes, OK. Um, <laughs> I think everything here is, is fascinating. Um, so I don't know if I'm going to put up a, a topic or not. I have to commit, huh? But anyways, In some, theory. Some, I mean, some things that I've been talking to people about here today are um, bandits, which I mm -hmm. presented on last year, and a couple of other people have presented on. But it's a kind of a nascent topic. And so I've been quizzing some of my colleagues who are working on it today to try to learn more about it. Awesome. Let's thank our panelists one more time. Thank you.